Hello, and welcome to our first session of Node's 2019 Lightning Talks. Welcome to this 10-minute Lightning Talk. It depends on why it's the most frequent answer to modeling questions presented by Luann Mesquita. You can start now, Luann. Thanks, Elian. Uh, welcome everyone to this graph modeling session. My name is Luan and I run engineering at GraphAware. Uh, I've been a user of Neo4j for 10 plus years now and it depends is one of my favorite answers. So the goal of this talk is to show you the reason why you'll hear it depends from a lot of good graph modelers. So since we have only 10 minutes, we'll stick with a very familiar Neo4j uh, domain, which is the movie data set. So let's say you've been given uh, a set of data about movies, actors, directors, and so on. And someone tells you to go off and model a graph. If you're a relational database modeler, then you could give this to about to a couple of people and they would all go off. They would apply a set of mathematical rules and arrive at a normalized model. And it would all be the same with the exception of maybe column and table name differences. But you could be pretty sure that everyone will arrive at this consistent model with just the data that you've provided to them. With a graph, it's not quite that simple. So the first person could come back with a model that looks like this, which is two nodes, a person and a movie with two relationships between them, the acted in and the directed and a simple set of properties on these nodes and relationships. So the, the roles are um, an array of strings and the movie and person both have simple properties for the name, title, and genre. And is this a valid graph model? Of course it is. Is it a good graph model? It's impossible to tell because we don't really know what you want to do with this graph. Person number two has decided that he or she will take a completely different approach and has decided to make the genre a node and related to the movie via the has genre relationship. So is this model better than the first one? Again, this is impossible to tell because you don't really know what purpose this graph model is serving. If you hand this to yet another person, they could come up with this where genre isn't a node here, but now it's a label on the movie node. Again, is this better than the first one or the second one? We have no idea. And the fourth person could decide to treat the role as a first class citizen of the graph and pull that out as its own node. Um, maybe this model is better, maybe it looks more complex and certainly more colorful, but is it actually useful? We don't actually know this. And so at this point, a lot of new graph modelers are terrified because there are so many ways to build a graph model and no one can even tell you at this point whether it's good or not. But really, there's nothing to be afraid of. Graph modeling is an extremely useful exercise um, and it really helps you validate your understanding of your domain and your problem on something as basic as a whiteboard. The way you naturally represent your domain and the way you think of it is how you tend to draw it on your whiteboard and this usually ends up being your graph model. There might be a few tweaks for performance uh, optimizations at some point, but really the, the model you draw on your board is the model in your graph. There are no normalization rules required, and this means that all stakeholders can participate. Uh, it's not restricted to database modelers. It's not restricted to developers. Uh, you can have your product owners, project managers, your customers even participate in graph modeling. And one of the very underrated benefits of graph modeling, I think, is the fact that it tends to expose gaps in thinking, and it can also identify missing data early on in the process, uh, which is much better than figuring out quite late in your development cycle that you can't actually fulfill a particular use case. Because you need to understand your domain really well to draw it, and you need to understand what questions you're asking of that domain, you will have to put this down on the whiteboard. And it's quite apparent if you don't really understand the domain very well. And once you start mapping your data to your graph model, you will find out very early on that the functionality that someone has asked you for is not really possible because you don't have data. So this is 
I think, a very key benefit as well to modeling your graph. Apart from all of this, even if you're not using a graph database, it's really useful to model your uh, domain as a graph. And honestly, if you draw it as a graph and think of it as a graph, then most likely you do need a graph database after all. So now we're going to walk through, we're going to start with this very basic uh, candidate model, which has a person and a movie, right? And we're going to start talking through how the question can affect the way you model your graph. So this is our base version. And now we have a set of questions. Should the role be a property on the relationship, or should it be a node? Should the genre be a property on the node? Should it be a node itself? Should it be a label on the movie? Should it be both? And lots of other questions. And of course, the answer is, it depends. So what is the question? This is really, um, really the question that follows the is it depends answer. And the reason we ask this question is to know what you want out of the graph. The use case or the question you're asking will really determine the most suitable graph model to, of course, answer the question in the first place and allow for the most performant queries to be executed over your graph model. And at the end of the day, you really want to keep things simple. You want to model just enough, but no more. So your use case is really important to help you constrain uh, your model to really the problem at hand and not try to go into future use cases that might, might never really come up and adversely affect performance uh, because of this. So use case number one, as a movie fan, I want to find a movie and see actors and their roles. So we are, we are just going to extend our initial candidate model very slightly, and we're going to put the title and the genre on the movie node and the roles as an array of strings on the acted in relationship. I think everyone is very familiar with this model. It features in all of the Neo4j training and tutorials and plenty of uh, talks. So what do we think about this model? This is a valid graph model. Does it answer the question? Yes, it does. And there's nothing wrong with this. This is actually a very good model for the use case that we're trying to answer. You can find a movie. You can navigate via the acted in relationship to all actors. And you can pick the roles up from the property on the relationship. And it's efficient. It's clean. And it answers the question. But what, what about if this wasn't your, your use case? Let's see how the graph model gets affected. So we have a different use case here. And as a movie fan, I want to find movies in genres similar to my favorites. If we just step back a bit, you can start to see that there's a problem if we were to model it this way, because the genre is buried as a property on the movie node. And to, pull, to, to even figure out what are similar genres, it, it just can't sit here. So the solution to this is to pull the genre out. Uh, now you have separate nodes uh, representing this, you can have a relationship called similar to between them, and you simply connect the movie to the genre via the has genre relationship. Can we answer our question or our use case? Yes, you can. You can simply start at a movie node, traverse out through the genre relationship, uh, find similar genres, hop one more time to other movie nodes, and the use case is satisfied. Uh, it also retains properties that allow it to satisfy the first use case. So right now, even if you're developing in an iterative model, then this, this model still fits. Let's do one more. As a movie fan, I want to find actors who play the role Neo and the awards they won for this role. So again, stepping back, the roles are now in an array on your acted in relationship. So even if you wanted to do a really, really inefficient and not advisable thing of loading all your relationships for acted in, checking to see if Neo was a role in them, and then picking up the person and the movie, you would still be stuck associating an award with this role, because the award is really for an actor that plays a particular role in the movie. And in this case, what we would do is we, we need to relate, really, we need like a four-way edge. So person, award, role, and movie, only these make sense. Uh, for the award. And so we introduce here a hyper edge which contains local context about the person acting in the movie, the role he or she played, and the award that this role won. 
So again, all, all three models are valid models if you take away the use case, but they may not be suitable models when you actually try to answer the question that you set off to answer. So to summarize, you should always know your use case before you start to model your graph. Keep it simple and intuitive. That's the beauty of graph databases. Uh, keep in mind the shape of your graph, the size of your data, the density of relationships, index selectivity, read versus write trade-offs, all these go hand in hand with your model uh, to ensure that you have the best performance possible. And of course, you should always measure performance, but as with everything, do not prematurely optimize because as you could see, even in 10 minutes, that graph model refactoring is really easy. So that's the end of my slides. And now I will move on to the Hunger Games, I would read the questions out to you. And there's a link at the bottom of the slides which tells you where to answer this. So the easy question is to be able to model your graph, you should know A, your use case, B, what the weather is, or C, should you have a handy list of hair metal bands. Medium question, should I model this fact as a property of a node or a node? A, a property of a node, B, a node, C, it depends. Question number three, sometimes you need an edge that relates more than two nodes. So what do you do? A, use a relationship between two nodes and store the context as properties. B, use a hyper edge. C, model with multiple nodes, but identify that they belong together with a group ID. Elaine? Thank you, Luann. So uh, people that are watching this, if you're participating in the Hunger Games, please go to that link that I posted in the chat and answer these questions. We'll leave the questions up here for the next three minutes um, so that uh, folks can answer them uh, in the form that we've provided the link to. And um, I see no questions, Luann, in the chat. That's good, I suppose. Although Risa, Risa posted something. She said, love the title. The students in my DB course know the default answer is it depends. <laughs> so she appreciates. That's great. Yes. If anybody has any comments or questions for Luann, you could type them in the chat area. They're probably busy doing the Hunger Games thing. <laughs> I see a question. What is a hyper edge? Uh, shall I go ahead and answer that? Yes, Luan? sure, sure. Okay, so I I won't switch my slide because of the because of the Hunger Games, but. It's um, so it's not um, it's not a feature really. That's it's more of a concept, and it serves to say it serves to model really when you have an edge that needs to relate to plus nodes. So in the case in the example we saw earlier, you you really couldn't have a relationship between the person and the role and the role and the movie because you would lose context if a person played two roles in a movie, for example. And then when you have the award, the award is really specific to the person and the role played in that particular movie. So really what you're looking for, if you if you try to draw this, you would really have a four-way four edge. And of course, this is not possible in, in a graph database. Every edge has you know two, two nodes on either end. So the concept of a hyper edge is really represented as a node that all the relationships come into. And this hyper edge is a node that's very local to, to, the, to, the, um, to the related no, uh, nodes, really. So for, for every combination of um, person, role, movie, and what was it, award, you would have one 
node, which represents the hyper edge. And you will see in the slides from earlier, they, they typically don't have a label because you, you never want to look them up directly. They're not a first class concept, um, but they just serve to tie together this context. Okay, thank you. So that's the end of our presentation. Um, thank you very much, Luann, for presenting today.